Good afternoon, gentlemen and ladies. I am C1C Emma Pockin, and these are my teammates, C1C John Satcher, C1C Sam Castanian, and C2C Michael Palo. Today we're going to be discussing the issues surrounding the practice of Bacha Bazi. We're going to begin by discussing our ethical and legal premise for our line of discussion. Then we're going to delve deeper into the question of whether or not we have an ethical obligation as well as legal jurisdiction to respond to this issue. Finally, we're going to outline our policy that we have laid out in correspondence with current U.S. strategic policy in Afghanistan. For our ethical premise, universally, Bajabazi as a practice is completely unethical. From the U.S., you can look at Western philosophy, any of the major philosophers from Kant to John Stuart Mill to Aristotle, any way you look at it from Western philosophy, this is a completely unethical practice. Kant, in particular, states in his second formulation of the categorical imperative that it is unethical to treat any <coughs> human being as a means to an end without simultaneously treating them as an end in and of themselves. So in the practice of Bajabazi, they are clearly using these young boys to their own, as, their, as a means to their own end rather than an end in and of themselves. Looking at Afghanistan, it's also completely an unethical practice based on the Quran and Islamic teaching. We can see that in explicit rulings in the Quran itself, the Hadith, as well as contemporary fatwas that all state that it is completely forbidden to deny the, the rights of a child to torture, to kill, and to rape. So knowing this, knowing that it's completely unethical from any standpoint, we know that we're not risking um, not giving a certain degree of cultural respect to Afghanistan, Rather that, rather that we can do that and have that be compatible with also enforcing this universal moral standard. So the question becomes then not whether or not Bajabazi is wrong, because it absolutely is, but rather do we have an ethical obligation now to respond to this, as well as do we have the legal um, jurisdiction to respond to it? And furthermore, is it strategically wise to respond to this issue based on what our objective goals are in Afghanistan right now? By looking at the law, we can see that Bajabazi is also entirely illegal, both in the international community, from the United States perspective, and Afghanistan. To begin with, there's the concept of use kogans, which states that there are fundamental liberties provided to everyone that are non-derogable rights. And this includes the right to life, or the right to security in person, to be safe from harm, or the right to be um, up, uh, away from slavery, or be enslaved. Under the United States Code, Title 18, Part 2, Chapter 110, Sexual Exploitation and Other Abuse of Children lays out the law that states that you cannot abuse children, you cannot sexually exploit them, and protects them under the U.S. Civil, uh, the US Penal Code. With the Afghan Penal Code, while this is the latest version that we could find from 1976, it states under Chapter 8, Adultery, Pederasty, and Violation of Honor, Articles 427 and Article 429, that children cannot be exploited in this fashion. Now those who do, it states that you would go to jail for a very long time, and this is going to be part of our strategic recommendation on how to impact Afghan legal structure in order to protect children from Bajabazi. So back to the ethical question, do we have a responsibility to act? Ethically, yes. Now to establish this, we're relying upon just war theory, which is broken into three separate parts, use uh, ad bellum, use in bellum, and use post bellum. Uh, before the war, during the war, and after the war. Now we're going to be focusing on use post bellum uh, to establish this uh, this ethical question. And in addition to this, we have a duty to rescue and a responsibility to protect. We'll go more into this. And when I say we, I'm talking about the United States, but the stakeholders is much larger than that. Um, it's the military, the politicians, and civilians of the United States, as well as in Afghanistan, the police force the leaders, the civilians, as well as the international community all have a stake in the outcome of this specific situation. Now what's very important about this, the reason why we have a responsibility to act here in Afghanistan, is because between the Taliban's uh, rule, or uh, while they were in charge between 1996 and 2001, uh, Bajabazi was essentially non-existent. Now that we've toppled at, uh, the regime in Afghanistan, we have an ethical responsibility, specifically in Afghanistan. That's why our ethical responsibility doesn't go into other countries or other parts of the world. The United States uh, shouldn't become the world's police force in this specific area. 
So the legal question more or less becomes, do we have jurisdiction as the United States to intervene in the practice of Bajabazi, or who does, whether it's the international community, the United States, or Afghanistan? And breaking up, breaking up the idea between the United States and Afghanistan, there are several bodies of law that we must look to. The first is the bilateral agreement with the United States and Afghanistan, military installation jurisdiction, and finally, the international the international force that the United States has with regards to international humanitarian law. In Afghanistan, who is less restricted in this practice, we look to domestic law, treaty obligations, the Geneva Conventions, and the whole body of human rights law, which applies outside of conflict and will specifically apply to today's question of who has proper authority legally to end the practice of Bajabazi. So back to use postbellum, we're in a rehabilitation period with Afghanistan where we're trying to establish a minimally just state. Under the Taliban, it was not a minimally just state, which means that the leadership has a, uh, they're looking towards creating the uh, human rights of uh, the civilians and ensuring that they have rights, ensuring that they're not going out and committing crimes such as Bashbazi. In addition to this, we're advocating for police and judicial retraining. Now, this doesn't mean Western uh, countries come in and impose their rule or their specific philosophy in the area, but uh, educating and training the current judicial and police force in the area, giving them the ability to try and the ability to convict those that are creating or uh, uh, utilizing Bajabazi. And this would be a legitimate regime it's because they have a uh, human rights interest in mind and they're looking out for those individuals, the civilians under them. So as we look at the ethical duty to rescue and the responsibility to protect uh, in varying degrees, there's a duty to rescue here for both the United States and Afghanistan. As we look towards multiple philosophers, uh, Feinberg, Ross, in the United States, it's accepted that there is a duty to rescue when that does not come at a moderate cost to the individuals. And seeing as we have already been in Afghanistan now for 15 years, we've already uh, sought to implement policy and reform the area, we would seek, uh, or we would see a much greater cost at not reforming the practice of Bajabazi than we would at providing these resources to the Afghan population. Further, there is the idea in Islamic law of INCAD, which is a duty or a responsibility to rescue individuals who are suffering harm, and those who do not uh, are held accountable by Allah. So, there is acceptance on both sides of the aisle here from the United States and Afghanistan that there is a duty to rescue. And as we look towards a responsibility to protect, an idea that was put forth in the 2005 World Summit and was later codified by the United Nations Secretary General in 2009, when a host nation who is responsible for the human rights uh, and the protection of their citizenship fails to do so, it is the responsibility of the international community to assist and reform such a situation so that human rights are protected for all individuals. And so the United States, as well as the international community, is required uh, under this responsibility to protect, to provide assistance to the Afghan population that is suffering from this practice. Now that we have established that there is an ethical responsibility to intervene in the practice of Bajabazi, we go to the question on how we will do that on a legal basis. So with the United States, there is no legal responsibility that we have currently to allow us to go in and end the practice of botch bazi. Simply from our bilateral agreement in 2016 that states any person that commits a crime on U.S. territory, meaning, excuse me, not U.S. territory, the U.S. installation the military base, the criminal will fall to the host nation. So an Afghan person who is committing botch bazi will go under Afghan law. And this is a protection mainly for the U.S. forces, though we keep control over our people and can prosecute them ourselves. But that hinders our ability to go in and end Bajabazi on our U.S. installation. So we turn to the Afghan domestic law to how we are going to rectify this problem. However, there's the problem that the ADLP or the Afghan police force is part of this situation. And as I stated earlier, a person who commits these crimes against children goes to jail for a long time. It's undefined. And the consistent practice today is that they'll go to jail for only one or two days. So this is in order to help bolster holding these people accountable. We'll look at our strategic solution of looking to how we may be able to restructure or recreate this judicial system. We can also turn to 
the international body of law that we have at our disposal. And the most applicable treaty to today's discussion is the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is abbreviated as the CRC, and the optional protocols for the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, the United States has signed and then ratified the optional protocols, but Afghanistan has ratified it. The difference between signing and ratifying means that the United States simply cannot go against the basic principles involved in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. They cannot go against the fundamental ideas of protecting children as a signatory. Now, a person or a country that ratifies the treaty has to put in positive law in order to protect those individuals under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So there must be ways that you can prosecute people who do not follow this body of law. And the Convention on the Rights of the Child is a part of human rights law, which means that it applies in all circumstances. And we also have at our disposal the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which protects the basic rights to life, security, and these are non-derogable rights, once again. The United States has ratified it, so when we go into other areas, or within, even within our own country, we have to have positive law that protects individuals under the ICCPR. So now that we've established that there is a legal responsibility, a, uh, excuse me, an ethical responsibility, a legal responsibility, how do we implement this on a strategic level? Is it wise to go forth with these procedures? And we would say, yes, this is our plan of action for how we're going to end Bachabazi in Afghanistan to begin with empowering those who have legal responsibility, which would be mainly the Afghan domestic uh, judicial system. The Geneva Conventions Common Article 3 outlines that there are certain fundamental rights to those at all times in the times of conflict, which means that we can go back to when the war was occurring and these practices were still happening and prosecute those individuals at a higher level who may have known that this was going on or should have, should have known that this was going on, this practice and continually parallel this to the International Criminal Court of Yugoslavia or Rwanda for types of practices that continue to go on in Afghanistan during times of conflict. Furthermore, we look to going back to the domestic idea, which is to recreate the police system, and as that we will talk about. Exactly, so the second facet of our strategic plan is to look at the way we're doing and executing our training for the ALP right now, which is essentially whether we're training them on issues of personal hygiene or human rights, we're using our American soldiers to give them that training. And it's been very, very ineffective. So instead of doing that, we wanna look at their own culture and pull from their own Islamic law and see how we can revitalize that program. So we looked at um, teachings from the Quran and Islamic teachings, as well as a very recent 2014 congregation of the most contemporary fatwa, which is a group of 120 Islamic scholars that come down and have clout similar to the Pope would in a Catholic, in, within Catholics. Um, and they basically came down with a, a point by point list of revitalized, um, not reinterpreted, but kind of bolstered ideas of what different Islamic teachings mean. And one of those was that it is forbidden to come down with a ruling for Muslim people if you yourself are not an Arabic speaker or a Muslim. And so coming from that cultural perspective, we can see how they, um, the ALP would have the attitude that they do not like being told what to do from Americans who don't have, a cult who don't have cultural relevance. And so instead of having our American soldiers complete this human rights training, we want to have actual Afghan people who speak the language and have that cultural cultural relevance to give them that human rights training so that it has a much bigger impact. As we look towards the United States portion of the uh, solution here, United States commanders, United States soldiers still have that responsibility uh, to report all crimes up the chain of command, uh, whether the accused individual is a United States citizen or an Afghan nat national. Now, ever since 2006, <coughs> the uh, military has had the ability to uh, practically act as a different entity. Now, uh, military forces, infantrymen, are essentially a destabilizing force. They topple regimes, they defeat armies. Now, as we look towards the counterinsurgency doctrine that was created in 2006, specifically outlined by Army Field Manual 324, the military has an ability to provide a stabilizing force in the region. They have the ability to provide an occupational peacekeeping force uh, with cultural sensitivity that is called for by counterinsurgency operations. Further, the United States military would seek 
uh, to provide for this cultural sensitivity and a combination of, with the legal understanding that we already have. Something that we've uh, decided to nickname Judicial Green Berets. And much, Five minutes remaining. Thank you. And much the same way that uh, a Green Beret would enter a community and provide that community with the education and the ability to stand up for themselves as a military unit, these Judicial Green Berets would be individuals with the religious, cultural, and political know-how of Afghan nationals to be able to enter these communities, speak with village elders, and insert themselves in the Jirga, which is a name for the collection of village elders that makes decisions uh, in Islamic and Afghan culture. So as we look towards these Judicial Green Berets, these would be individuals who can provide for a human rights uh, education in the area, who can provide for a structuring of judicial systems by these Jirgas uh, very similar to the way that the United Nations oversaw the Gakaka courts for the ICTR, that's the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda. So these organizations, the ju these judicial powers that are functions not of a sole individual, but rather of the community and the community's elders. And so we would seek to empower them by providing this human rights education by these individuals who are termed uh, judicial Green Berets. In conclusion, this is the ethical, the legal, and the strategic decision to make. This proposal is ethically wise because the United States has a uh, responsibility to act in this area. Legally, we have the ability to train and give power to the current uh, Afghans in power in their specific regions. And finally, strategic, we have the ability to stop current and future uh, uh, problems in the region and to ensure that we have a, a solid uh, future for Afghanistan. At this time, we welcome any questions that you may have. Um, thank you. Um, great presentation. Uh, my question is, Bajabazi, it's, it's an issue, right? So we're over there prosecuting a war. Right? So our, our generals, admirals, are on the ground prosecuting this war. Uh, where do you think addressing this problem falls on a priority list if they've got, you know, IEDs to worry about and any number of other things. So as we look at the priority of Bashabazi, we're looking at, at what is functionally uh, a stability or an instability question. Uh, if they do not have the support of uh, the ALP, the Afghan local police, if the judicial system, the national individuals who are in charge of it, as well as the regional lower subcourts, do not have the support of the people, which is what we've seen clearly uh, for the past year. Uh, village elders, as well as the common population in Afghanistan, they are exhausted with the idea that these individuals who perform Bashabazi, who enact crimes upon Afghan people, are not being brought to justice. If the Afghan uh, police force, the Afghan judicial force that we have sought to create and assist does not have the support of the population. We're looking at a reversion to, uh, you know, in five years after we have left Afghanistan, another reversion to Taliban-like rule, uh, to an overthrow of a national government that is not seen as sufficient by the people. So this comes in uh, not at an immediate level. Obviously, this is not the same as responding to fire or uh, trying to clear IEDs through convoys, but this is uh, part of the judicial system that we seek to implement and is strategically one of our largest concerns in the area to provide that support to the Afghan uh, systems so that they have the support of the population, they have a human rights foundation that they can survive on. You've established a uh, legal, ethical, moral basis for change and, and it's a fine presentation. How do you account uh, for the acceptance of the practice, the lack of past efforts to change, if it is so wrong, uh, by the society. Yes, sir. Actually, surprisingly, um, there hasn't actually been a, a lack of willingness to change. In fact, if you look at the practice of Bachabazi when the Taliban was at its height of power between 1996 and 2001, they had all but virtually eliminated it. Now that <clears throat> is partially because the Taliban obviously is very intimidating, influential, and powerful. Um, but so we can see by looking at that that it, it is possible to to almost completely eliminate this practice. It just needs to be heightened to a level of awareness, and we need to partner with the locals and the um, 
and the leaders to revitalize their judicial system so that it is um, heightened to a level of awareness that they actually act upon instead of, as, as Sam mentioned right now, the law in their penal code actually says as a punishment for, for rape of a child is jail for a long time, is the wording of it. And so simply by even changing the wording to a specific minimum punishment um, and bringing that awareness about, we think that it will be very possible to enact change. And, and that's not imposing the Western judicial system as uh, my colleague was talking about earlier, but looking to the Quran and various other Islamic authorities to have that mind. May, may I ask one follow-on? Uh, so in your example, you are uh, you're advocating the way that change was done was through execution. So although you say you want to uh, support the penal system, the only example you have where societal change against an accepted practice has come through the death penalty. Is that ultimately where the Afghan penal system has to go to change the practice? No, sir, absolutely not. I think that uh, of at least a minimum of a few years in prison, as well as an understanding from the, from the ALP that they will receive some kind of penalization. Because right now, as we've seen with this particular case study, there was no retribution for the leaders who were performing these acts. And so I think even, even a minimum punishment is going to change the attitude. And we do have the backing from the locals, because as we can see, um, the locals hate that this is happening, obviously, because it's happening to their children. And if we have the support from the locals, I think we can get the support from everyone else. Right, as we've seen with this practice and with uh, traditionally Afghanistan, after 2001, after our interdiction uh, overthrowing the Taliban, this is not a question of a practice that we cannot eliminate. In, uh, instances of financial corruption wouldn't be said to be Islamic practice that we cannot eliminate simply because they have occurred uh, because there was a temporary lawlessness and there's not been a perfect restructuring of their judicial and legislative systems. So as we implement a system that can provide accountability and can issue forth uh, not only determinations of guilt, but also the subsequent punishments that are uh, tied to that guilt and tied to the criminal practice, uh, we'll, we'll see a revision in uh, this cultural practice. We'll see reductions in these rates the same way in the United States when a law is enacted, uh, when we have a judicial oversight and when we have individuals going to prison for that, uh, that practice teeters off. Originally, we went into Afghanistan to defeat the, uh, or to eliminate Al Qaeda, who had been responsible for 9-11. At that time, our primary focus was certainly on the military side. You all have been addressing uh, what I'll call winning the peace. Uh, how important do you think winning the peace is, or this changing the culture as you have described it, to winning the peace, and does that then ultimately help winning the overall war, which now is to, I presume we're all in agreement, to get a more democratic system, eliminate the Taliban, and those kinds of repressive uh, governments. So uh, as we can see, the military importance of this is much the same as the military importance of providing a stable society in Afghanistan. Uh, as you have probably seen in the news reports of the practice of Bachabazi and really the event that brought it forth to the Americans' uh, recognition uh, from the entire civilian population is that these individuals who suffer this child sexual abuse are at some point picking up a firearm and firing upon and seeking to kill those individuals who abuse them as well as everyone in the nearby vicinity. Uh, so we've actually lost United States service members, uh, Britain has lost some of their own service members simply because of the proximity we have to these Afghan local police commanders who are performing the practice. So much in the same way uh, an animosity fuels the recruitment process for almost all terrorist organizations. By the way of eliminating this practice by creating a society in which there are not the substantially harmed victims of abuse and of the practice of Bachabazi, we'll be eliminating a source of instability, we'll be eliminating a source 
of rage that would seek to uh, that would seek to continue uh, violence in the region that would seek to take up arms not only against Afghan local police but also uh, their coalition partners. Uh, just a general question, and you, you established that it's unethical. You established that there's legal grounds on both the U.S. The international and the Afghan side. This is wrong, and it's legal to do something about it. You feel all the patterns and justification are there. You're looking at just war to do something about it. So, what do you see as a purpose? Uh, uh, for the U.S. military and the U.S. politicals who had people go to court martial have said, forget about it, turn your back, it goes on. What level of training, indoctrination, and, and what kind of support in the local military commanders get if, if they try to correct this? You know, in other words, you have all the rules and laws and the ethics, but so what do you so what do the local people in command with responsibility and the chain of command do about it? Because they don't seem to have the right twist. So what do you see in the future that, that uh, will go on to improve the situation? Right, so in the future we're looking at uh, providing these resources. Obviously, as you said, the law's there and we've attempted to provide the training to these individuals. We've brought in uh, American judicial experts, legal experts, individuals who are briefing uh, the <coughs> Afghan local police and Afghan military forces on human rights education. Unfortunately, this message is not being accepted specifically because of the differences between Western and Afghan culture and the different uh, styles by which we would seek to impart that education. So through our policy recommendations, providing this through regional partners, cultural partners, and religious partners, who have the same understanding of human rights as we all do, but are also able to impact educational change upon these individuals, uh, the Afghan local police and the military forces, uh, that's going to provide a much more thorough education for those individuals than any Western uh, fronted or Western ideological uh, education could provide. And so I think that what we're speaking to right now is a gradual change as opposed to what you may be asking right now, which is what are we going to do specifically now? And that's something we can change. We, we control parts of this police force. We can fire individuals. We know that our committee of these crimes, we have that ability to go in and rectify it immediately and then go on with this change continuously to promote the human rights acceptance, to implement learnings from the Quran and make the better strategic decision overall to find that peace that we were speaking of earlier. And we'll make sure that our U.S. leaders know that they have an understanding that there is a zero tolerance policy for this, and if they know that it's occurring, they will report it to the Afghan authorities so that they can have the jurisdiction to then act on it. You, you put forward a solution of a judicial green right? There is the divide that you've established between being Islamic or Muslim and non-Muslim. Does it imply that your Green Berets have to be of the faith in order to be effective? You've established a record where we're not effective because it's of that difference. So these individuals that we would seek to be judicial Green Berets don't necessarily have to be of the faith, but they have to be of the understanding. So the same way we look at regional partners who are able to speak uh, Arabic, Pashtun, who are culturally significant forces, but are not necessarily religious leaders, who do not also have to be Muslim, but they have to have an understanding of what a Muslim would think about this scenario of how an individual would be affected by their religious doctrine. So as we look going forward, these individuals do not have to be Muslim, but they have to have received the training and the education to know why this faith impacts the individuals of the Afghan population. And the reason why it's escalated in the form of the actual human rights training and why we want those specialists to be of the faith and culturally relevant is because they're the ones that are actually saying, here's what right action looks like, here's what you are and are not allowed to do according to our faith, according to ethical action. And so that's the difference between our human rights trainers and these judicial reverberates.